All right, I'm going to bring up the uh, placeholder screen here in a second, just so somebody, people have something else to, to look at while we wait for this. Uh, I am, I'm going to grab a backup beer here. Um, beer cam isn't showing what I'm drinking, and I didn't adjust the, maybe that's what I'll do while we wait for some people to come in. That's right. A little liquid courage for this experiment. Let's see, let's get the camera on our sailor of the day. I just got this guy's stuff not too long ago. I have to investigate him. It was actual named items. So I can look up his service history. You can see the bottom of my monitor there. But anyway, um, yeah, a little Lagunitas, little something, something ale. Maybe that's, mm, I'll go check. Well, let's see here while we wait. Um, I want, hopefully, well, I'm going to give this a few more minutes. Maybe we'll we'll do it exactly at uh, 11. Well, no, maybe a little after 11. Because um, once I start this, I can't restart it. And also, I can't hear it because it's in as a media capture on um, Streamlabs. So I'm going to have to, I'll mute my mic. But if you guys want to give me feedback on... Um, the audio levels and if it's coming through at all and if it's not i have a backup plan that may take me a second or two but we'll see but uh hopefully some other folks will stop in here in a little bit to get the uh the full bit of it and if not like i said this is sort of a radio play sort of idea um it's not necessarily a viewing party it's you sit down or just put it on the headphones and walk around. I'm going to turn off alerts because as much as I enjoy, you know, and part of the, well, the reason I'm here is to, you know, entertain people. And if they um, show that they like what I'm doing by dropping a follow or whatever, I do like that. But that's not necessarily the reason I'm doing this stream today. I want to give people something a little Christmassy. Um with a with a twist at the end and um to sort of take people back to a time like when i was a kid i used to listen to the old radio plays from the 40s and, and 30s so this is sort of a radio play but there will be placeholder visuals some video uh clips here and there that i put in that i thought sort of fit and a couple of little audio samples that i added in i think that will add to the story hopefully i edited this thing correctly and i'm going to get a backup beer and then um <clears throat> i'm going to i'm going to i'll do it right now just to double check and unfortunately i'm what i'll when we start the the radio play i'm going to mute my mic and i have to listen to it on my phone because i can't hear it through the headphones because streamlabs won't pick it up since it's an uh a media capture and I have not figured out how to get around that um, give me a second here I'm gonna mute the mic and I will be right back All right, the what I'm drinking is up to date. That's good. I like that. All right, I'll be right back.
All right, I'm going to bring this over to um, the start screen. Let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. All right, I'm going to do that. Oh, where am I? Well, let's go to ending. How's the end of the show? Oh, there's the beer cam. Where am I, though? Hang on. Let me. It is activated. Again, it wouldn't be my stream if it wasn't. Old man struggles with technology. Hope everybody is having a good Christmas Eve. Hopefully the levels are all right so far. Um, I'm going to give this just a few more minutes. Be and if people come in and start asking questions as to what we're listening to, if somebody wants to... I I'm not going to address it verbally, orally. Um because I just want to let the story play, but we'll address it in chat and explain it to them. Um, just give me a second here. I want to do one final... Um, alert to some friends. And... Then in a couple of minutes... I know there's nothing more exciting than waiting and staring at this and can't even get the beard straight. Where's the beard? A um, <clears throat> little background. This story is set in 1957 uh, on Christmas Eve. And I'm not going to go any further than that aside from there are vampires, goblins, and ghosts. But not necessarily what you are picturing in your mind right now. This is not a Halloween story. Uh, and it's not Nightmare Before Christmas. So, I'll give this a few more minutes here. Uh, doing my final, hey, we're live. And again, you know, I've set it up so that... Um, well, I haven't set it up. It's set up so that this hopefully won't get copyright struck. But uh, this will be around for two weeks, a la the uh, Twitch saving of live streams, etc. I'm going to go back so I can actually enjoy this. Oh, uh, you can hear the phone chattering to the internets. Get this back on volume down on my phone so we don't hear me currently how's everything uh in everybody's corner of the world um here chilly but clear it's supposed to get rain tonight Beard. <clears throat> um we'll put in our placeholder beer here since the camera can't quite catch that full photo of that sailor all right, Lagunitas, a little something, something. And, mm, I have yet to find a good camera angle for the, the beer drinking. <clears throat> that over there. All right, what time is it? 11.07? Do you mind, um, for those of you who are out there, oh, and let me make sure I've turned off alert box. Oh, I, I can't do it until I get into the screen <clears throat> and I'm when we go to the oh yeah we're getting a break we're getting some tonight every and I think I said yesterday every year that it comes to Christmas time since it's like snowed here a couple times over the last century on Christmas Day down at sea level we always have a storm coming in and everybody goes it's gonna snow no it's not um let's see here Okay, good. Cleared that. Um, so yeah, we'll wait to 11.15. I know for... Actually, Cerebrus, welcome. We're going to do a, a, a Christmas story. I'm not going to play a game right now. But stick around. Get a warm blanket. Get some brandy or whatever, you know, fruit juice if you don't drink. Or get some hot chocolate. That would go good with this story. We're going to have a, a, a Christmas Eve story set in 1957. And as I said uh, just a little bit ago, 
Farron. That will really help this story. <laughs> um, there are going to be vampires, ghosts, and goblins, and Christmas. But again, as I said a little bit ago, it's not going to be what you're picturing. It's not Nightmare Before Christmas. This is something else. This is a radio play. Um, well, it's not even a radio play. This is a reading that I came across several years ago. And um, <clears throat> I'm a sentimental old fool. Um, it is one of those stories I listen to it and I get a little choked up at the end or choked up here and there. So you're not going to see me on camera. Um, but I thought it would be, it ties in with sort of the people who dig history and um, who play war games, you know, warships, warplanes, war thunder, all of that. Um, I figured there was a common ground there with the people who play that and this story and they might enjoy it. So I'm going to give it about five minutes. And then once I start it, I can't stop it because it's a media capture. Um, and hopefully... It works on the first time and hopefully i edited everything correctly <laughs> if i didn't we'll restart it uh, with a backup plan um and i was saying earlier i've added in some visuals placeholder stuff so but you don't need to watch this i added some film clips here and there from some old movies i found that sort of fit and a couple audio samples that i think are cued at just the right moment to add a little bit Maybe in the next year, I'll work on this as a project so that next year, I, I want to make it a tradition if I'm around next year, um, <clears throat> to what I would really love to do is have a whole group of people like in War Thunder recreate this story. Um, but at the very least, I'd like to go take the story and foley it like they would do with an old radio play. So all the sound effects are there and adds an extra dimension or two to the audio quality, you know, like the quality of what you're hearing, not necessarily like the actual audio quality, but the story, add to the flavor of the story. Um, so we're going to sit here for a few minutes. I know you're going to stare at my mug and I'm not playing a game to distract you, but... Um, want to see what we can do here and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this i love this story that doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to but i think you know this is sort of like when we i did the pearl harbor uh viewing party before playing the game or the um batfish USS Batfish submarine stream where we started out with uh, a video of an episode detailing her three submarine kills towards the end of the war. This is sort of in that spirit, but it's also in the Christmas spirit. Or, you know, if you don't celebrate Christmas, hey, that's fine. I we won't go down that road. Um, and hopefully it's just some entertainment at this time of year. There you go. So let's see here. And I will, as I said, I'm going to mute my mic. I'll pull myself off of the screen. So all the communication will be in chat. And uh, if somebody drops in and they don't know what's going on, if somebody wants to fill them in, feel free. I'll try to do so as well. But once it starts, it rolls. And that's why I'm just waiting a little bit to see if we can pick up a few more people so we don't have to sit here and explain what's going on. But looks like there's nine of you out there and i do hope you'll stick around for a nice little christmas story has some history tie-ins if you play war thunder or world of warplanes world of warships world tanks i think it might be a christmas story that's up your alley and i'll keep rambling here for a few minutes we have two minutes and i hope this works at least on the first try we'll know real soon let me know in in chat if the audio is, is good, as in the levels are good, not too loud, not too quiet, and we'll go from there. I swear I haven't, I hope, I edited this as a film last night in Vegas, and I hope I didn't like edit out a chunk and not realize it because I was making all these splits. So we'll see. And if I did, hopefully it won't impact the story too much.
So let's see, we are at 1114, so one minute until showtime. If people come in, I think they'll, they'll get the story and hopefully they'll stick around. And if you're here for the beginning of it, I got this, I cannot control this beard because it's in reverse. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I do hope you'll stick around. It's only a half an hour. And um, again, get a comfy chair, stoke the Christmas fire if you got one, smoke them if you got them, um, brandy, whiskey, beer, water, fruit juice, hot chocolate, hot chocolate with rum, um, and enjoy the, uh, the story. So we're coming up here and we're gonna see if I can pull this off. No promises ever, <laughs> no, not on that. Ah, the Nog, yes, a good Nog. All right, so I'm gonna go over to what is usually my World of Warship stream, and it's gonna be black, I think, if I've done this right. So let's go over to WoWs. There I am. All right, so I'm gonna find this. I'm gonna turn up my phone just for a second. There's the delay. And so this is so I can monitor the audio. I will mute my mic so that echo won't be there. So this is um, The Shepherd by uh, Frederick Forsyth. If you're familiar with the story, stick around. If you're not, stick around. Here we go. I'm going to remove me and the porthole. And here we go. I hope you guys enjoy this. I hope this works. Merry Christmas, whatever holiday you do or don't celebrate, here we go. I hope you appreciate the spirit that this is given in. Charlie Delta, clear takeoff. The controller's voice sounding in my headphones woke me. I eased the throttle forward slowly with the left hand, holding the vampire steady down the central line with the right hand. Behind me, the low whine of the goblin engine rose into a scream. The snub-nosed fighter rolled, the lights each side of the runway passed till they were flashing in a continuous blur. As the end of the runway whizzed beneath my feet, I pulled the vampire into a gently climbing turn. Down on my right thigh was strapped the map with my course charted on it in blue ink, but I did not need it. I knew the details by heart. Turn overhead Sally Airfield onto course 265 degrees, continue climbing to 27,000 feet. On reaching height, maintain course and keep speed at 485 knots. Check in with Channel D, the RAF's North German air control frequency, to let them know you're in their airspace. Then, a straight run over the Dutch coast and the North Sea. After 44 minutes flying time, change to Channel F and call Lakenheath Control to give you a steer. 14 minutes later, you'll be overhead Lakenheath. After that, follow instructions and they'll bring you down on a radio-controlled descent. 66 minutes flying time with the descent and landing, and the vampire had enough fuel for over 80 minutes in the air. From Lake and Heath, I knew I could get a lift down to London after midnight. By breakfast time, I'd be in my parents' home in Kent, celebrating with my own family. The altimeter read 27,000 feet. I eased the nose forward, reduced throttle setting to give me an airspeed of 485 knots, and held her steady on 265 degrees. Somewhere beneath me, the Dutch border would be slipping away, and I had been airborne for 21 minutes. All well. The problem started 10 minutes out over the North Sea, and it started so quietly that it was several minutes before I realized I had one at all. The first warning I had was when I flicked a glance downward to check my course on the compass. Instead of being rock steady on 265 degrees, the needle was drifting lazily round the clock. I swore a most unseasonal sentiment against the compass and the instrument fitter who should have checked it. Still, it was not too serious. There was a standby compass, the alcohol kind. But when I glanced at it, the needle was swinging wildly too. Apparently something had jarred the case, which isn't uncommon. In any event, I could call up Lake and Heath in a few minutes and they'd give me a GCA, a ground controlled approach. The second by second instructions a well equipped airfield can give a pilot to bring him home in the worst of weathers. I glanced at my watch, 34 minutes airborne. Before trying Lake and Heath, the correct procedure would be to inform Channel D, to which I was tuned, of my little problem, so they could advise Lake and Heath that I was on my way without a compass. 
I pressed the transmit button, but instead of the lively crackle of static and the sharp sound of my own voice coming back into my own ears, there was a muffled murmur inside my oxygen mask, my own voice speaking and going nowhere. The radio was dead. Fighting down the rising sense of panic, I swallowed and slowly counted to ten. Then I switched to channel F and tried to raise Lakenheath, but the steady whistle of my own jet engine behind me was my only answer. While I was vainly testing my radio channels, my eyes scanned the instrument panel in front of me. The instruments told their own message. It was no coincidence the compass and the radio had failed together. Both worked off the aircraft's electrical circuits. Somewhere beneath my feet, amid the miles of brightly colored wiring that make up the circuits, there had been a main fuse blowout. The first thing to do in such a case, I remembered old Flight Sergeant Norris telling us, is to reduce throttle setting to give maximum flight endurance. We don't want to waste valuable fuel, do we, gentlemen? We might need it later. So we reduce the power setting from 10,000 revolutions per minute to 7,200. That way we will fly a little slower, but we will stay in the air rather longer, won't we, gentlemen? I eased the throttle back and watched the rev counter. It operates on its own generator, and so I hadn't lost that at least. I waited until the goblin was turning over at about 7,200 RPM and felt the aircraft slow down. The main instruments in front of a pilot's eyes are six, including the compass. The five others are the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, the vertical speed indicator, the bank indicator, which tells him if he's turning to left or to right, and the slip indicator, which tells him if he's skidding crabwise across the sky. Two of these are electrically operated, and they had gone the same way as my compass. That left me with the three pressure-operated instruments, airspeed indicator, altimeter, and vertical speed indicator. I knew how fast I was going, how high I was, and if I were either diving or climbing. It is perfectly possible to land an aircraft with only these three instruments, judging the rest by those old navigational aids, the human eyes. Possible, that is, in conditions of brilliant weather, by daylight and with no cloud in the sky. By night, it is not possible. The only things that show up at night, even on a bright moonlight night, are the lights. These have patterns when seen from the sky. I knew Norwich very well, and if I could identify the great curving bulge of the Norfolk coastline, I could find Norwich, the only major sprawl of light set 20 miles inland from the coast. Five miles north of the city, I knew, was the fighter airfield of Miriam St. George, whose red indicator beacon would be blipping out its Morse identification signal into the night. I began to let the vampire down slowly toward the oncoming coast. As the fighter slipped toward Norfolk, the sense of loneliness gripped me tighter and tighter. The night sky... Its stratospheric temperature fixed, night and day alike, at an unchanging minus 56, became in my mind a timeless prison creaking with the cold. Below me lay the worst of them all, the heavy brutality of the North Sea, waiting to swallow me and my plane and bury us in a liquid black crypt. At 15,000 feet, and still diving, I began to realize that a fresh enemy had entered the field, far away, to right and left, ahead and no doubt behind me, the light of the moon reflected on a flat and endless sea of white. The East Anglian fog had moved in. There was no question of trying to overfly the fog to westward. Without navigational aids or radio, I'd be lost over strange, unfamiliar country. Also, out of the question was to try to fly back to Holland. I had not the fuel. Relying only on my eyes to guide me, it was a question of landing at Miriam St. George or dying amid the wreckage of the vampire somewhere in the fog-wreathed fens. At 10,000 feet, I pulled out of my dive, increasing power slightly to keep airborne, using up more of my precious fuel. Still, a creature of my training, I recalled again the instructions of Flight Sergeant Norris. When we are totally lost above unbroken cloud, gentlemen, we must consider the necessity of bailing out of our aircraft, must we not? Of course, Sergeant. Unfortunately, the single-seat vampire is notoriously difficult to bail out of. What else, Sergeant? Our first move, therefore, is to turn our aircraft toward the open sea, away from all areas of intense human habitation. The procedures were well worked out. They did not mention that the chances of a pilot bobbing about on a winter's night in the North Sea were one in a hundred of living more than half an hour. One last procedure, gentlemen, to be used in extreme emergency. That's better, Sergeant Norris. That's what I'm in now. All aircraft approaching Britain's coasts are visible on the radar scanners of our early warning system. 
If, therefore, we have lost our radio and cannot transmit our emergency, we try to attract the attention of our radar scanners by adopting an odd form of behavior. We do this by moving out to sea, then flying in small triangles, turning left, left, and left again, each leg of the triangle being of a duration of two minutes flying time. In this way, we hope to attract attention. When we have been spotted, the air traffic control is informed and he diverts another aircraft to find us. When discovered by the rescue aircraft, we formate on him and he brings us down through the cloud or fog to a safe landing. Yes, it was the last attempt to save one's life. I recall the details better now. The rescue aircraft which would lead you back to a safe landing, flying wingtip to wingtip, was called the Shepherd. I glanced at my watch. 51 minutes airborne, about 30 minutes left of fuel. I pulled the vampire into a left-hand turn and began my first leg of the first triangle. Below me, the fog reached back as far as I could see, and ahead toward Norfolk, it was the same. Ten minutes went by, nearly two complete triangles. I had not prayed, not really prayed, for many years, and the habit came hard. Lord, please get me out of this bloody mess. When I had been airborne for 72 minutes, I knew no one would come. I felt the rage of despair welling up. I began screaming into the dead microphone, You bastards! Why don't you look at your radar screens? Why can't somebody see me? All so damn drunk you can't do your jobs properly. The anger subsides. Five minutes later, I knew that I was going to die that night. Strangely, I wasn't even afraid anymore, just enormously sad. It's a bad thing to die at 20 years of age with your life unlived, and the worst thing is not the fact of dying, but the fact of all the things never done. I dropped the left wing of the vampire toward the moon to bring the aircraft onto the final leg of the last triangle. Down below the wingtip, against the sheen of the fog bank, a black shadow crossed the whiteness. It was another aircraft, low against the fog bank, keeping station with me through my turn, a mile down through the sky toward the fog. Being below me, I kept turning, wing down to keep it in sight. The other aircraft also kept turning until the two of us had done one complete circle. Only then did I realize why he did not climb to my height and take up station on my wingtip. I eased the throttle back and began to slip down toward him. He kept turning. So did I. At 5,000 feet, I knew I was still going too fast for him. To reduce speed even more, I put out the air brakes, slowing down to 280 knots. Then he was with me. 100 feet off my wingtip, and we straightened out together, rocking as we tried to keep formation. The moon was to my right, and my own shadow masked his shape and form. Even so, I could make out the shimmer of two propellers whirling through the sky ahead of him. Of course, he could not fly at my speed. I was in a jet fighter, he in a piston-engined aircraft of an earlier generation. He held station alongside me for a few seconds, then banked gently to the left. I followed, keeping formation with him, for he was obviously the shepherd sent up to bring me down, and he had the compass and the radio, not I. For the first time, I could see him well. To my surprise, my shepherd was a de Havilland mosquito, a fighter bomber of World War II vintage. And then I remembered that the meteorological squadron at Gloucester used mosquitoes to help in the preparation of weather forecasts. Inside the cockpit of the mosquito, I could make out against the light of the moon, the muffled head of its pilot, and the twin circles of his goggles as he looked out the side window toward me. Carefully, he raised his right hand till I could see it in the window. Fingers straight, palm downwards. He jabbed the fingers forward and down, meaning, we are going to descend, formate on me. I nodded and quickly brought up my own left hand so he could see it, pointing forward to my own control panel with one forefinger, then holding up five splayed fingers. Finally, I drew my hand across my throat. By common agreement, this sign means I have only five minutes fuel left, then my engine cuts out. I saw the muffled, goggled, oxygen-masked head nod in understanding. Then we were heading downward toward the sheet of fog. He pulled out at 300 feet. The fog was still below us. I could imagine the stream of GCA instructions coming from the radar hut into the earphones of the man flying beside me. I kept my eyes on him, afraid of losing sight, watching for his every hand signal. Two minutes later, he held up his clenched left fist in the window, then opened the fist to splay all five fingers against the glass. Please lower your undercarriage. I moved the lever downward and felt the dull thunk as all three wheels went down. In the moonlight, I caught sight of the nose of the mosquito. It had the letters J.K. painted on it, large and black. 
probably for call sign Jig King. He leveled out just above the fog layer, so low the tendrils of candy floss were lashing at our fuselages, and we went into a steady circular turn. I glanced at my fuel gauge. It was on zero, flickering feebly. For God's sake, hurry up, I prayed. I saw his left hand flash the dive signal to me. Then he dipped toward the fog bank. I followed, and we were in it. The visibility was down to near zero. No shape, no size, no form, no substance. Except that off my left wingtip, now only 40 feet away, was the form of a mosquito flying with absolute certainty towards something I could not see. Only then did I realize he was flying without lights. For a second I was amazed, horrified by my discovery. Then I realized the wisdom of the man. Lights in fog are treacherous, hallucinatory, mesmeric. You can be attracted to them, not knowing whether they are 40 or 100 feet away from you. The tendency is to move toward them. For two aircraft in the fog, flying formation, that could easily spell disaster. Without warning, the shepherd pointed a single forefinger at me, then forward through the windscreen. It meant, there you are, fly on and land. I stared forward through the now streaming windshield. Nothing. Then, yes, something. A blur to the left. Another to the right, then two, one on each side. Ringed with haze, there were lights on either side of me in pairs flashing past. I forced my eyes to see what lay between them. Nothing. Blackness. Then a streak of paint running under my feet. The center line. Frantically, I closed down the power and held her steady, praying for the vampire to settle. Bang, we touched. Bang, bang, another touch. She was drifting again, inches above the wet black runway. Bam, 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 rumble, rumble. She was down. The main wheels had stuck and held. Slowly, the vampire came to a stop. I found both of my hands clenched round the control column, squeezing the brake lever inward. I forget now how many seconds I held them there before I would believe we were stopped. There was no need to turn off the engine. It had finally run out of fuel as the vampire careered down the runway. I shut off the remaining systems and slowly began to unstrap myself from the seat. As I did so, to my left, through the fog, no more than 50 feet away. The mosquito roared past me. I caught the flash of the pilot's hand on the side wing, and then he was gone, up into the fog, before he could see my answering wave of acknowledgement. But I'd already decided to call him Gloucester and thank him personally. I expected the control tower truck to be alongside in seconds, for with an emergency landing even on Christmas Eve, the fire truck, ambulance, and half a dozen other vehicles were always standing by. Eventually, two headlights came groping out of the mist and stopped 20 feet away. A voice called, Hello there! I stepped out of the cockpit, jumped from the wing to the tarmac and ran toward the lights. At the wheel of the car was a puffed, beery face and a handlebar mustache. That yours? He nodded toward the dim shape of the vampire. Yes, I said. Yes, I just landed it. Extraordinary, he said. Quite extraordinary. You'd better jump in. I'll run you back to the mess. As we moved away from the vampire, I saw that I had stopped 20 feet short of a plowed field at the very end of the runway. You're oh, damned lucky, shouted. And he seemed to be having trouble with the foot controls. Judging by the smell of whiskey on his breath, that wasn't surprising. Damned lucky, I agreed. I ran out of fuel just as I was landing. My radio and all the electrical systems failed nearly 50 minutes ago over the North Sea. He digested the information carefully. Huh? No radio? No radio, I said. A dead box on all channels. Then, then how did you find this place, he said. I was guided in, I explained patiently. They sent up a shepherd aircraft to bring me down. It was one of the weather aircraft from RAF Gloucester. Obviously, he had radio, so we came in here in formation on GCA. Then when I saw the lights at the threshold of the runway, I landed myself. The man was obviously dense, as well as drunk. Extraordinary, he said. We don't have a GCA. We don't have any navigational equipment at all, not even a beacon. Now it was my turn to let the information sink in. This isn't RAF Miriam St. George? No, he said. This is RAF Minton. I've never heard of it. I'm not surprised. We're not an operational station. Haven't been for years. Minton's a storage depot. 
He stopped the car and got out. I saw we were standing a few feet from the dim shape of a control tower adjoining a long row of Nissan huts, evidently once flight rooms, navigational and briefing huts. The man returned and climbed shakily back behind the wheel. Just turning the runway lights off, he said, and he belched. My mind was whirling. Why did you switch them on, I asked. Well, it was the sound of your engine, he said. I was in the officer's mess having a nog, and old Joe suggested I listen out the window for a second. You sounded damn low, almost as if you were going to come down in a hurry. Thought I might be of some use. Remember, they never disconnected the old runway lights when they dismantled the station, so I ran down the control tower and switched them on. I see, I said. But I didn't. Where is RAF Minton exactly, I asked him. Five miles in from the coast, he said. And where's the nearest operational RAF station with all the radio aids, including GCA? Well, he thought for a moment. Mm, must be Miriam St. George, he said. Mind you, I'm just a store's Johnny. That was the explanation. My unknown friend in the weather plane had been leading me straight in from the coast of Miriam St. George. By chance, abandoned old store's depot Minton lay right along the in-flight path to Miriam's runway, and this old fool had switched on his lights as well. Result, coming in on the last ten-mile stretch, I had plunked my vampire down into the wrong airfield. I was about to tell him not to interfere with modern procedures that he couldn't understand when I choked the words back. My fuel had run out halfway down the runway. I'd never have made Miriam ten miles away. I'd have crashed in the field short of a touchdown. We stopped at the officer's mess and went in. The place had seen better days. My host, Flight Lieutenant Marks, shrugged off his sheepskin coat and threw it over a chair. I'm sorry it's not very hospitable, old boy, said Marks, going to the door and shouting for someone called Joe. Not to worry, I said, though I could do with a bath and a meal. Well, I think we can manage that, he said, trying hard to play the genial host. I get him sort of fix up a spare room. God knows we have enough of them. He'll also rustle up a meal. Bacon and eggs do? That'll do fine. While I'm waiting, do you mind if I use your phone? He ushered me into the mess secretary's office and then went off to supervise the steward. My watch told me it was close to midnight. Hell of a way to spend Christmas, I thought. Then I recalled how 30 minutes earlier I had been crying to God for help, and I felt ashamed. After a few minutes, the phone was ringing. I am Miriam St. George. Duty controller. Air traffic control, please, I said. There was a pause. I'm sorry, sir, but I'm afraid there's no flying tonight, sir. No one on duty in air traffic control. Then give me the station duty officer, please. When I got through to him, I explained about the emergency and that his station had been alerted to receive a vampire fighter coming in on emergency landing without radio. He listened attentively. I don't know about that. I don't think we've been operational since we closed down at five this afternoon. But I'm not on air traffic. I'll get the wing commander flying. An older voice came on the line. Where are you speaking from? RAF Minton, sir. I've just made an emergency landing here. I thought I was heading for your airfield on a ground-controlled approach. Well, make up your mind. Where are you or weren't you? You want to know. I took a deep breath and started at the beginning. So you see, sir. I was intercepted by the weather plane from Gloucester, and he brought me in. But in this fog, it must have been on a GCA, no other way to get down. Yet when I saw the lights of Minton, I landed, assuming it to be Miriam St. George. I'm ringing to alert you to stand down your radar and air traffic control crews, sir. They must be waiting for a vampire that's never going to arrive. It's already arrived here at Minton. But we shut all the systems down at five o'clock. There's been no call for us to turn out. But Miriam St. George has a GCA. I know we have, but it's been shut down since five o'clock. I ask the next and last question slowly and carefully. Do you know, sir, where is the nearest RAF station that maintains 24-hour emergency listening? Yes. To the west, RAF Barham. To the south, RAF Lakenheath. Good night to you. Happy Christmas. I put the phone down. Marham was 40 miles away on the other side of Norfolk. Lake and Heath was well over 40 miles to the southwest in Suffolk. On the fuel I was carrying, not only could I not have made Miriam St. George, it wasn't even open. 
It began to dawn on me that I didn't really owe my life to the weather pilot from Gloucester, but to beery, bumbling old passed-over Flight Lieutenant Marks, who couldn't tell one end of an aircraft from another. Still, the Mosquito must be back at Gloucester by now, and he ought to know that despite everything, I was alive. Gloucester, said the operator, at this time of night? Yes, I replied firmly. Gloucester, even at this time of night. The duty meteorologist took the call and I explained the position to him. I am afraid there must be some mistake, flying officer, he said. It could not have been one of ours. Our mosquitoes went out of service three months ago. We now use Canberra's. I stared at the telephone in disbelief. Then an idea came to me. What happened to them? They were scrapped, I think, or sent off to museums, more likely. Could one of them been sold privately, I asked. Well, I suppose it's possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And happy Christmas. I put the phone down and shook my head in bewilderment. What an incredible night. First, I lose my radio and all my instruments. Then I get lost and short of fuel. Then I'm taken in tow by some moonlighting harebrain with a passion for veteran aircraft, flying his own mosquito through the night, who happens to spot me, comes within an inch of killing me, and finally a half-drunk ground-duty officer has the sense to put his runway lights on in time to save me. Luck doesn't come in much bigger slices. Flight Lieutenant Marks put his head through the doorway. Your room's ready, he said. Number 17, just down the corridor. Joe's making up a fire, the bath water's heating. If you don't mind, I think I'll turn in. Will you be all right on your own? Yes, sure, I'll be fine. Many thanks for all your help. I took my helmet and wandered down the corridor. From the doorway of 17, a bar of light shone into the passage. As I entered the room, an elderly man began to rise from his knees in front of the fireplace. Good evening, sir, I said. I'm Joe, sir, the mess steward. Yes, Joe, Mr. Marks told me about you. Sorry to cause you so much trouble at this hour of the night. I, I just dropped in, as you might say. Yes, Mr. Marks told me. I'll have your room ready directly. Soon as this fire burns up, I'll be quite cozy. While I ate the plate of sizzling bacon and eggs, the old steward stayed to talk. You've been here long, Joe, I asked him, more out of politeness than genuine curiosity. Oh, yes, sir. Nigh on twenty years now, since just before the war, when the station opened. He told me of the days when the rooms were crammed with eager young pilots, the dining room noisy, the bar roaring with body songs of months and years, when the sky above the airfield snarled to the sound of piston engines, driving planes to war and bringing them back again. I rose from the table, fished a cigarette from the pocket of my flying suit, lit it, and sauntered around the room. The steward began to tidy up the plates. I halted before an old photograph in a frame standing on the mantel above the crackling fire. I stopped with my cigarette half raised to my lips, feeling the room go suddenly cold. The photo was old, but it was still clear enough. It showed a young man in his early twenties, dressed in flying gear, but not the grey suits and plastic crash helmets of today. He wore thick, sheepskin-lined boots, rough serge trousers and a heavy sheepskin zip-up jacket. From his left hand dangled one of the soft leather flying helmets they used to wear, with goggles attached instead of the modern pilot's tinted visor. He stood with legs apart, right hand on hip, a defiant stance, but he was not smiling. There was something sad about his eyes. Behind him stood his aircraft. There was no mistaking the lean, sleek silhouette of the Mosquito fighter bomber. I was about to say something to Joe when I felt the gust of cold air in my back. One of the windows had blown open. It took me two strides to cross to where the window swung on its steel frame. To get a better hold, I stepped inside the curtain and stared out. Somewhere, far away in the fog, I thought I heard the snarl of engines. But it was probably just a motorcycle or some farm boy. I closed the window, made sure it was secure, and turned back into the room. Who's the pilot, Joe? I nodded toward the lonely photograph on the mantel. That's a photo of Mr. John Cavanaugh, sir. He was here during the war, sir. An Irish gentleman, very fine man, if I may say so. As a matter of fact, sir, this was his room. What squadron was that, Joe? I was still peering at the aircraft in the background. Pathfinders, sir. Mosquitoes, they flew. Very fine pilots, all of them, sir. But I believe Mr. Johnny was the best of them all. But then I'm biased, sir. 
I was his Batman, you see. There was no doubting it. The faint letters on the nose of the mosquito behind the figure in the photo read J.K. Not Jig King, but Johnny Kavanaugh. The whole thing was clear as day. Kavanaugh had been a fine pilot, flying with one of the crack squadrons during the war. After the war, he'd made a pile of money, bought an old mosquito in one of the periodic auctions of obsolescent aircraft, refitted it, and flew it privately whenever he wished. Not a bad way to spend your spare time if you had the money. So, he'd been flying back from some trip to Europe, had spotted me turning in triangles above the cloud bank, realized I was stuck and taken me in tow pinpointing his position precisely by crossed radio beacons. Knowing this stretch of the coast by heart, he'd taken a chance on finding his old airfield at Minton, even in the thick fog. It was a hell of a risk. But then, I had no fuel left, so it was that or bust. I had no doubt I could trace the man, probably through the Royal Aero Club. He was certainly a good pilot, I said reflectively, thinking of this evening's performance. Oh, the best, sir, said old Joe. They reckon he had eyes like a cat, did Mr. Johnny. I recall many's a time the squadron return. He'd have his mosquito refueled and take off again alone, going back over the channel of the North Sea to see if he could find some crippled bomber making for the coast and guide it home. I've seen pictures of them, I said, and he used to guide them back. I could imagine them in my mind's eye. Gaping holes in the body, the wings and the tail, creaking and swaying as the pilot sought to hold them steady for home. A wounded or dying crew on the radio shot to bits. I turned from the photograph and stubbed my cigarette butt into the ashtray by the bed. Quite a man, I said, and I meant it. Even today, middle-aged, he was a superb flyer. Oh, yes, sir. Quite a man, Mr. Johnny. I nodded gravely. The old man so obviously worshipped his wartime officer. Well, I said, by the look of it, he's still doing it. Now Joe smiled. Oh, oh, I hardly think so, sir. My Johnny went out on his last patrol Christmas Eve, 1943, just a mite over 14 years ago tonight. He never come back, sir. Went down with his plane, Somewhere in the North Sea, he did. Good night, sir. Uh, happy Christmas.
All right, give me a second here and I will answer the questions as best I can. Oh, gotta mute that. That's my monitor. All right, give me a second here and let me get into the, let's see, will this work? There we go. So the, uh, the narrator is Alan Maitland, as I recall. I'm gonna jump over into the interwebs. The story is The Shepherd by Frederick Forsyth. And that particular reading, I'll post a link to the wiki on it, but uh, that particular, particular reading became a, um, it's sort of a tradition now in Canada to play this. I know. There's another version of it. There's a couple different versions of it, of not him reading it, but there's another person reading it and it has a little bit more of the technical detail. Uh, this particular reading, they, they edited it down ever so slightly, um, probably for storytelling uh, purposes. <clears throat> but um, yeah, Frederick Forsyth, he wrote Day of the Jackal and the Odessa Files, um, is the author. So the story uh, behind it is... <sighs> I can't remember when it was. It was a Christmas. Yeah, CBC apparently played this. Um, yeah, I'll, so here's, let me, let me, let me get over here. Let me, I'll control V in, control V. There is the Wikipedia entry on it. Um, there are some things on YouTube where you can hear uh, like a CBC audio broadcast of them introducing it and how it's become a tradition. Um, whether they still do it or not, I don't know. But um, the story behind the story is that the author sort of played a joke on his wife. His wife apparently had wanted a particular diamond ring for Christmas. And, you know, he wrote the Odessa Files and beer, hang on. And all of that. So he, you know, he was a little flush with money. <clears throat> and on, I want to say on Christmas Eve, I can try and link the, and get it to play, but it would just end up with, in te it'll all end in tears if I tried it. I'll find the link for it and post it in chat in just a second. But my understanding is that um, she wanted a diamond ring and pointed out a particular one. And it came up on Christmas Eve. She asked if uh, Mr. Forsyth had gotten her that diamond or had gotten her a gift for Christmas. And he said he, oh, Oh, I forgot to get you a gift. And she was very upset and said, well, maybe you can write me a ghost story. And so he sat down in an afternoon and wrote 10,000 words, this story. And uh, on Christmas Day, hmm, presented her the story wrapped in a ribbon and gave her the diamond ring as well. Exactly. <laughs> so let me find, give me a second here, because this is all be haphazard, but let me go over to YouTube and it'll take me a second to find it, but I'll post the link so you can check it out. Um, uh, the Shepherd, Forsyth, and then Okay, I'm okay. I'm what I'm gonna try and okay. I am going to try and uh, hopefully there won't be a commercial before it. We'll drop a um, give me a second. I just need to set this up. We're gonna drop over to the wows. It's gonna be dark. Clear takeoff. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 we're gonna start the story again, which I'm not really averse to. Let me let me bring me up. There we go. Let me bring up the porthole. Come on. There you are. Um, let me add in. 
Okay, let's do this. No, 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 no. Window capture. And we're going to... There it is. We're going to add a new source. Uh, I'm going to call it Fred. Okay, now we're going to get all that in window. What? what no, no, no. Da, 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 da. There we go. All right, done and done. And give me a second here. I'm going to bring it up to full screen. So this is Frederick Forsyth's description of uh, the story. A little tousle-haired kid from the Second World War. I was just obsessed with flying. I think it was the winter of <laughs> 1974, and my wife was going through all the cupboards before Christmas looking for her present. She couldn't find one. And the reason was simple. It was, it was a diamond ring, and I was keeping it in my pocket. I suppose just pulling her leg. I said, I'm awfully sorry, darling. I forgot to buy you anything for Christmas. So she was very, you know, miffed at this. And said, so, well, write me a ghost story then. And I thought, that's odd. I've never written a ghost story. So uh, I thought I hit on the idea of, of this pilot The Shepherd is quite a simple story. A young pilot flying back from Germany to Britain, Christmas Eve, 1957, has a total and catastrophic electrical failure which knocks out all his radios and all his compasses and everything else. Bad enough. But then he finds below him the whole uh, landscape is covered in thick fog. He is going to die because he cannot find his way down. And then he sees a Second World War plane on his wingtip guiding him down. So he follows the guy, and the guy finds safe landing, a, an abandoned old Second World War airfield, then flies off. The last line is the twist in the tail. And in one sitting, I think it was Christmas Eve afternoon, I just wrote it, about 10,000 words, and got up and gave it to, gave it to him the next morning, wrapped with a ribbon around it and the diamond ring. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, let me. Oh, well, we're gonna cancel that, and then we're gonna drop out. And yeah, I know. I know. Catalina Stuka, all of that. Um, oh, let me move the chat box over. Let's see. Come on, where's chat box? There we go. So anyway, I'm glad you guys stopped by for that. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, maybe you know, if I'm still doing this in a year, we'll. We'll make it a tradition. <clears throat> but yeah, I have <clears throat> I I discovered that story probably about three or four years ago. And let me like go back over to let's see the address screen just so we can do this a little bit better. Um and I thought it would be fitting. Uh I as I said, I, as a kid, enjoyed uh, listening to the old 1930s, 1940s radio plays, and this fit in with it. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, tell your friends. And it'll be, you know, unless they mute it, um, the replay should be available, you know, like in my, my videos, for two weeks. So feel free to share it, um, you know, with anybody that you think would enjoy that sort of thing. No, the story itself is the, the, the fact that this guy wrote it in one afternoon in one sitting. I mean, this is like the the best Twilight Zone episode that was never filmed is my thing, and, and then. Um, like, you know, then you go into, um, so we'll, we'll toss this out since we get it, you know, a couple of you guys here for discussion. So, uh, I picture an actor in one of two roles, either the main role or just in the photo. Um, I would cast Ewan McGregor, either as the pilot trying to get home or the mosquito pilot. And then you get into... Who would you cast as the airfield guy? Who would you cast as the guy on the phone from the, the various, the different weather stations? Who would you have play them? Uh, I think Richard E. Grant needs to be in there somewhere. Perhaps one of the first airfields he calls. I mean, 
anybody knows you and McGregor, pass it on to him. Maybe he can independently produce this because it, I personally think, you know, particularly, you know, um, what's his name? Oh, I know it's not New Zealand, but I think he'd dig it. Uh, Lord of the Rings director, Peter Jackson. Give it to him. Make him produce a half hour short. Get Ewan McGregor. Maybe, uh, what's his name? Gandalf can, can play the uh, old Joe. You know, who knows? It stretches uh, credulity, credulity a little bit, having him be that old. But, you know, I can see Richard E. Grant in a role. I could see some other uh, English actors in these roles. And it, it does, personally, it totally deserves to be a, a movie short, a film short. Throw 3D at it. Do all of that, you know? And do it tastefully, but I think it I think it would be something that could be sort of back like in the old days where you'd have two cartoons before the main feature. Show this as a little short before the main feature. Jude Law. Jude Law could be in this. But I'm glad you guys stopped by for it. I mean, you know. Tell your friends, have them come, you know, if, if there's people that you know who like history, who like ghost stories, all of that, show them the link, let them enjoy it. And, you know, I wasn't, and the purpose of this wasn't to, you know, get a whole bunch of views or whatever. I wanted people to appreciate it, and I'm glad you guys stopped by for it. So, um... Yeah, but feel free to comment on it. You know, who 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 could you see having played in this? Who else? Liam Neeson. <laughs> and I wasn't expecting a whole bunch of views from this because there's a whole bunch of other huge, bigger streamers going on right now. But I wanted to put it out there. It'll be on the replay. Um, I'll probably download this and then post it over to my YouTube channel because I want to share it there for a couple friends who don't have Twitch accounts, but definitely glad you guys stopped by for this and, uh, we'll make it a tradition because I'm, I'm really hoping I'll be here for at least, uh, uh, a few more Christmases and, uh, I thought it was the perfect Liam calls. <laughs> I'm going to find you and I will land on you. Oh, and, uh, oh, the guy who played Dr. Ozymandias in the, uh, the Watchmen series that just aired on HBO, he could be in this as well. You know, because it's post war, all these guys are just a little past their prime, aside from the jet fighter pilot. <sighs> sounds like most of them are sort of reservists or have been, you know, they saw the war, but they're still there in 1957. It deserves to be, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm rambling now, but I think it absolutely deserves to be visual as a radio play. I've, I, I love this thing. I've, I've listened to it about 10, at least 10 times in the last two days. Just trying to go, okay. And then I found this one film that was like the snippets of the flight commander um, and tossed that in there and uh, found a couple of YouTube videos that had flybys of mosquitoes and dropped in the sound effect on it. Um, I want to find... I found a couple, but the, the I couldn't sample them because they were too short and you'd start to get a repetitive pattern in the audio, even though at first it just sounds like a, a, a flat tone, you would hear it. It would be like, but it wouldn't be quite that. I want to find like a good 30 second straight run of a goblin engine and then drop that in below while he's flying out over the, the, the North Sea and all of that. Um, trust me, I've looked up uh, vampire flying at night, 
mosquito at night and there's not a lot of footage left so i would have to that's the other thing is like getting a bunch of people like say um what's his name oh squire on youtube get into war thunder figure out some way to recreate this throw a night filter on it you know there's all sorts of different little ideas that i would love to see people run with if they knew about the story um let me look one more time here let me bring this down a second so yeah um story has been broadcast nearly every christmas since 1979 in canada on the cbc radio one news program as it happens read by alan maitland the recording air always airs on the last episode on or before christmas eve there's another adaptation, uh, December 14th, 2014. Uh, actor Nigel Anthony performed an original adaptation uh, with music and sound effects at St. Clement Danes, the Central Church of the Royal Air Force in London. The performance in aid of the RAF Benevolent Fund was introduced by Frederick Forsyth. Sound design was by David Chilton with a cappella pieces from the St. Martin Singers. Uh, <clears throat> on Christmas Eve 2016, BBC Radio 3 broadcast a new adaptation by Amber Barnfather for Between the Ears, performed by actor Luke Thompson. Sound design was by David Chilton, but with music and mouth and body percussion by the St. Martin Singers, specifically recorded for the production at the Church of St. Giles gills in the field the van and vampire aircraft sound effects were spent ah oh, lucky bastards specially recorded at the royal air force museum london between the ears the shepherd won a golden radio award in 2017 in the 2017 new york festival's international radio programs award in April 2017, Between the Ears won the most original podcast. So there's a podcast to this. I got to go hunt it down now. Uh, Gold Award at the inaugural British Podcast Awards. For the 50, 50th anniversary of As It Happens, Carol Off, Michael Enright, and Tom Power celebrated the tradition of reading The Shepherd by reading lines from the story. So this thing's got a lot of history behind it. Uh, let's see, history. Forsyth created this original work as a Christmas gift to his first wife, Carrie, after she requested a ghost story be written for her. Written on Christmas Day, 1974, and published near that time a year later, the idea came while trying to think of a way of setting, setting away from the typical haunted homes and seeing planes flying overhead. Many have speculated that references to pre-existing RAF folklore. While well, Forth Forsyth is a former IRA RAF pilot and could have heard and adapted such a story, either with or with an, without intent to do so, no references or anecdotal evidence have been, have been put forward to support such claims. So, there you go. I love this story and I wanted to share it with some folks and I'm glad that you guys came by for it. I really am. Um, and that you, you, you seem to enjoy it and we'll make it a tradition. I'll see you here again next year. I'm going to take a break. I may game a little bit, but I'm going to shut this down so it's its own stream. Um, and again, Thank you very much for stopping by. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Again, share. I'm and I'm when I say share this with your friends who may appreciate it, I'm not like if they're not on Twitch, I don't care. You know, it doesn't matter to me so long as somebody enjoys this because I th I think more people deserve to know the story. Because it's a really good Christmas Eve. Like I said, it's the best Twilight Zone episode that has never been filmed. <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm gonna shut this down for a few uh i gotta go dig some gifts out of the car trunk and wrap them before the significant other gets back um and i wish you guys 
all a very merry, happy, whatever it is you celebrate or don't. Tomorrow, even if you don't celebrate, I hope tomorrow is an absolutely outstanding day for you and brings you something that means something to you. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and if I come back to play, I'll be here. But thank you guys for stopping by. I I'm glad you enjoyed this. I'm glad I'm glad my editing didn't mung up the whole project. <laughs> and uh you guys take care. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.